So we're recording this just a few hours after the end of the UK general election. And we don't usually cover sort of the micro of politics on the channel. We usually sort of uh, look at what the underlying dynamics, what the underlying cultural dynamics are. But we think this is a really good opportunity to talk about some of the subjects we've been talking about on the channel because we think some of the frames that we've used can maybe help to highlight what's been going on. For those who haven't uh, watched or don't follow UK politics that closely, uh, I think a fair summary would be a Conservative landslide, Boris Johnson uh, winning a big majority, and the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn going to their lowest seat total since 1935. Like it's, it's the pretty much the, I would say, the destruction of the left, which is um, something that's quite close to, to my heart. We'll talk a bit about our own political kind of background as well in this piece. But I think what's really important for this it's one of the meta frames, one of the bigger frames that we've been looking at since the beginning of the channel, since Glitch in the Matrix, is where progressives, the left, liberals generally go wrong. What the blind spots are and what, because of, whether you're on the left or the right, a healthy left is good for a healthy right, it's good health for a healthy politics. We've been covering a lot of different threads on the channel and it feels like a lot of them converge in a moment like this. So we've been covering the ongoing polarization in culture, this inability we have to talk to people who have differing opinions. Related to that is the fact that we're existing, we're spending a lot of our time in social media filter bubbles. So we're seeing over and over people who think like us. I've noticed this on Facebook today, you know, the, the particular bubble I'm in, everyone's kind of shocked because there, you know, there's a lot of, I have a lot of very progressive friends, um, and it seemed, it would seem like up until this moment, it's like Labour was just definitely going to win because we all think like this. And then there's just yet again, huge upset. So as well as that, there's also the, the, the shadow. We talk about all the time on the channel and especially the shadow of progressive politics and the shadow of liberalism. It's like, what is the, what is the thing that's not being seen that is creating these major surprises and these major upsets? So we're going to play a lot of different clips and weave in a lot of the different um, people we've had talking about this. And then finally also, what do we need to know about our own biology? What do we need to know about our own psychology that's playing into this? So something that often gets overlooked is us as individuals, where are we, where are we contributing to this whole milieu of you know, the world going upside down as a lot of people see it? And what can we then do about that? So yeah, we'll be playing some clips from films that we've already put out and we'll be playing some new material as well. Uh, something from Diane Musho Hamilton, amazing mediator, uh, Zen priest, and uh, an expert on integral theory. We've used the integral map quite a bit in the past. And Daniel Schmachtenberger. So we had War on Sense Making uh, a couple of months ago, and that was a big hit on the channel. We've got War on Sense Making 2 coming out next week, and we're going to play a couple of clips from that. And I'm going to play one clip from him now, which I think, so really for me, this whole well, I'll talk about kind of my political biography and sort of where I'm coming from in a minute, but what this whole, especially now, this, this sort of real um, demolition of the Labour Party, the left in the UK, and after a really toxic election campaign where so many people had a sense that none of the parties really were uh, fit for purpose, like the politics just wasn't fit for purpose. It's like, if we accept that the world is changing massively and changing quickly and that we need some kind of new synthesis, which is what we've been talking about on the channel a lot, like what would a new synthesis look like? And I think a new synth synthesis would involve probably going beyond sort of fairly outdated concepts of left and right, uh, what the integral uh, worldview has called a more integral position, what does a place beyond the polarization look like? We're going to explore that a bit. And I think it's also like deeply intertwined in thinking for ourselves and moving beyond groupthink and tribalism. And I'm going to play Daniel's clip around that because I think it speaks to it perfectly. We were talking earlier about Facebook and the way that um, echo chamber type phenomena just built into algorithms can, let alone the social tribal type dynamics that are made easier, not in person, lead to echo chambers where people think that most everyone believes kind of the way they do because that's what they're seeing except those bad guys over there that are far that are far enough away that they only get the caricaturized version of them the essential thing to good sense making is a commitment to earnestness like a sincere profound commitment to earnestness in our sense making 
which means that the enemy of that is bias of any kind. And which means vested interest of any kind. And so the desire to fit in my group is a source of bias and vested interest because my group might have things wrong or be missing stuff. So another concept I find really useful from Daniel Schmachtenberger is the, the process whereby we outsource our sense making. And I think that's something I've seen quite a lot of in this particular election because to stay completely up to date with everything that's going on requires actually quite a bit of work, requires a lot of reading, requires a lot of focus. I think that level of self-responsibility is part of that new political or social paradigm. There's a, there's a huge amount of, as Jordan Hall has also said in the channel, a huge amount of pressure comes or responsibility comes on the individual. And we all have to take that responsibility. We can't really anymore be outsourcing what we think to other people. If I don't understand the partial truths and the values that they care about, I don't have a chance of understanding reality. And if I don't understand even beyond that why it's compelling, I don't have a chance of possibly engaging in a constructive or meaningful way. So all I can do is villainize them and engage in warfare. And then to various degrees, win or lose, but to some degree, all lose. And like that's a very, very simple thing I would suggest everyone do. If you tend to be left-leaning and most of your friends kind of agree with you about climate change or abortion rights or whatever, I would actually really like you to find, follow Ben Shapiro, follow the Propertarian Institute, follow, um, you know, ver follow Heritage um, Foundation and Cato Institute and whatever, and actually seek to understand both where they're sharing things that you actually didn't know. And even where you really disagree why it's compelling with an answer that isn't just because they're all stupid. Um, because you actually don't have any chance of healing a culture war otherwise. You only have a chance of engaging in it. And if someone happens to be more right-oriented, and of course saying right-left is itself oversimplified, but we'll use that as a simplification for all of the perspectives that are engaged in some kind of warfare that actually need to be engaged in some kind of more generative dialectical conversation. Um, study intersectionality. Like, follow some of the thinkers that are actually giving arguments for and history for why some of that's important. Actually, read some of the postmodern thinkers. Read Foucault and Derrida and whatever before just saying all postmodernism is stupid. And again, look to see are there true insights and critiques in there? And can you factor them? Do you understand them? And even where you don't think they're true, can you see why they're compelling? So we've talked a lot on the channel about polarization, where conversations break down, and particularly filter bubbles. And I felt that probably most keenly around this sort of politics, and especially around the left, especially around Labour in the UK. So my background, I was, my, my family was sort of Labour through and through. Uh, we went to like like classic kind of left-wing CND marchers, um, labor activists. I remember going kind of leafleting with my dad when he was a, a labor activist back in the day. And so it's always kind of been my home is the Labour Party in the UK. So I know I've gone on a bit of a journey since, but I know that psychology really, really well. I know that that tendency on the left to make judgments about people based on their views. Like that, that was part of my psychology for quite a while when you're growing up. It's like, oh, is that, per is that person a Tory? Is that person a conservative? Or this sort of checklist of the acceptable views to have and then kind of checking against it and being like, oh, is that person, yeah, that per is that person good or bad? This kind of implicit kind of othering that the left does. And I think is that, that that force that has kind of run rampant says so much about what's going wrong in culture at the moment. And in, like the, the, the big film that kind of we pretty much started off Rebel Wisdom, Glitch in the Matrix, really, I mean, I mentioned in that how the, the post-2016 uh, realization had been that that's effectively what had driven Trump and driven Brexit was this, this realization that there was a sort of liberal worldview that considered itself to be really, really inclusive, really, really uh, compassionate, but actually was very dismissive and very judgmental towards a whole swathe of the population and was this sort of hidden tribalism of liberalism. And that's been something that I've gone on a real journey around and been very outspoken on Facebook. Like I've, I've been, after Corbyn was elected in 2015 uh, as leader of the Labour Party, 
and I saw how many of the people around me, how many of my friends, how many of the people in my filter bubble were supporting him, I was like, actually, filter bubbles are an existential threat and I'm going to start speaking out. And I've been, so what I see Corbynism as, and I'm going to post a, 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 an article below here where uh, someone I know a little bit, David Hirsch, wrote about the politics of Corbynism in 2015. I think it's still the best thing that was ever written about it because he basically said, Corbynism styles itself as being compassionate and being inclusive and being on the side of the many, but actually in practice what Corbynism does is it otherizes anyone who doesn't agree with their particular narrative and their particular view on the world. And I think that's absolutely true. I think that's been borne out by all of the experiences that I think a lot of us have seen on social media, like how toxic and nasty the Labour Party has got for people who are considered other. Uh, that's kind of undeniable and also how much it had then was widely rejected by the working classes, by all of the traditional Labour supporters. Labour has been decimated in the seats where it was strongest and I think that kind of wake up call, you have to kind of look at that and see why has that happened. So I've been on quite a different political journey to most of my friends in that I started uh, fairly left-leaning and then started exploring a lot of particularly libertarian ideas, anarchist ideas, and started moving uh, increasingly to a space where it became difficult to define, is it left or right? For example, I, I really value individual liberty extremely highly. Uh, however, I also believe in a social safety net. So I, you know, saying I'm a libertarian also doesn't feel quite accurate. But what is interesting about it for me is that on days like today, when, when a lot of my friends are gnashing their teeth and pulling their hair out and feeling very kind of upset about the result, um, my, and I'm not understanding why people might have voted in that way, that's the key thing. I often feel I, I have an understanding of that because I share a lot of the core values um, that a lot of people might uh, be acting on when they're voting for, for things that my friends don't understand. So I think the easiest way for me that I found to frame it is Jonathan Haidt's work. So Jonathan Haidt wrote a, he's a moral psychologist, I think uh, is the best way to describe him. He wrote a book called The Righteous Mind, which is incredibly useful to, to look at, well, I mean, why are we so righteous about our, our political beliefs? And he's done a lot of research looking at the, the core moral foundations that we have and looking at morality in general. So there's a lot, so really big with um, liberal, let's say that's again a loaded term, but liberal people is care like caring for others, which obviously we, we all care about. But it like, ranks very, very highly. And his point is that there are other, let's say, moral taste buds. So there's fairness cheating, loyalty and betrayal. There's authority and subversion. There's liberty and oppression and sanctity and degradation. And, and uh, conservatives tend to rank roughly evenly on a lot of those. So it becomes very difficult for someone to, from one moral value system, which you're born with in a lot of ways. You know, it doesn't make you better or worse where you land on these, no, no more than your sexuality makes you a better or worse person. It's just how you're geared up. And you know, I personally, temperamentally, am geared up much higher on a lot of those other moral taste buds. So I have a certain uh, understanding of, okay, I understand why someone might care about being loyal to your country or why someone might care about the sanctity of um, the nation state or whatever it might be. Um, while I might share different politics, uh, it, it, it makes sense to me. And what I've noticed with this election in particular is um, a lot of people in my particular bubble just not being able to understand how anyone could think differently. How could anyone vote conservative because they don't care about people? It's like, well, everyone cares about people. They just care in different ways. Everyone cares about fairness. That's ingrained all the way. I mean, chimpanzees, Franz Duval uh, wrote a great book. Um, or several great books around animal empathy. It, dogs have empathy. Like, we all have empathy. We all care about other people. We just express it in different ways. We we express fairness in different ways. And understanding that, I think, is absolutely key for this political moment right now. Yeah, and Jonathan Haidt's work, I think, maps on really well to Ken Wilber's kind of integral framing. Because if you understand that people take uh, have different views based on probably in, instinctive temperaments, inbuilt temperaments, then you start to get a meta perspective naturally that there are different perspectives and different perspectives have different values. Uh, I love what Jordan Greenhall said, I think it was in the original Glitch in the Matrix film, where he said that what we've done through social media 
is we are splitting off into uh, tribes based on temperament and that could be an extinctionary trajectory because we're only particularly effective in groups of mixed temperament. That's how we're built. We're designed to work together in groups of mixed temperament. And what we've done is kind of weaponized temperament against each other and then polarized into these different fragmented groups. And that could very well be an extinctionary uh, trajectory for, for mankind. I think that's a really beautiful kind of idea of, 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 of how we're splitting society. Um, and now we've started talking about uh, integral theory. I think it's good to, um, to bring in Ken Wilber's framing because I think it really talks very well to what's going on, particularly with what he calls green, postmodern, liberal consciousness and why it's basically, in his view, kind of collapsed in on itself, which I think is, is played out perfectly in what we've seen with, with the Corbyn wave and how it's now kind of collapsed in on itself. What's getting left out is you have this green multicultural egalitarianism that's being taken to such extremes, it's really becoming absolutistic in its view. So you have absolutistic to multiplistic to relativistic. And the problem with relativistic is it becomes very open to what's called performative contradictions. It becomes very open to self-contradictory statements. It does it almost all the time. So it'll maintain, for example, that it is universally, undeniably true that there is no universal truth. Um, it'll maintain that all knowledge is social construction. It's all an interpretation. It all depends upon which culture it's arising in. And yet everything that I just said that represents the green point of view. It maintains that its view is not culturally constructed. It's true for all people at all places at all time. It's not a matter of interpretation. It's got real truth. Nobody else has truth because objective truth doesn't exist. But that view itself is held to be objectively true by the postmodernists. So they do get caught up in this enormous kind of contradiction. And they do tend to absolutize their view. There are two ways you can end up at absolutistic beliefs. One is that you're just on your way up through the growth stages yourself, and you're at that stage. And people, by the way, can stay at that stage for the entire adult life. The fact that we have higher stages doesn't mean that you have to develop there. It's one of the problems. Um, but so they'll have that absolutistic view just because they're on the way of passing through it. But if at any higher stage you latch onto a view with such absolute, uncritical absolutism, you can start to regress to the actual absolutistic stage because that's where you feel right. That's where you feel, yeah, this is, I know I've got it right. This is it. So you end up regressing to, to an absolutistic ethnocentric stage. And the problem with that is that it is ethnocentric. It is tribal. And identity politics lends itself to tribalism because what you're emphasizing is your particular tribe. And you'll know if you're doing that from a world-centric stance if when you talk about your tribe, in addition to whatever important differences there are. You also talk about what your tribe has in common with all the other tribes. Then that's world-centric. There's a unity in diversity with that. But if you just talk about your tribe and how it's different from all the other tribes and is there some sort of special attention, that's ethnocentric, absolutistic tribalism. So I think um, Ken Wilber's point around this kind of absolutism that comes with these developmental stages is really key because um, e each of the stages up until the second tier when, when people, uh, we become able to see and hold multiple perspectives, each stage up until then, um, the argument goes, tends to think it's right. It's like, I'm right about the way I see the world and it, it's impossible to see it in any other way. We're the good guys. You know, and again, that's something I see 
very often, I think, in any election that, that comes up. And there is a paradox in, so integral is, the idea in integral is that we're able to see and appreciate multiple perspectives. The paradox is that green, postmodern, thinks that it often thinks that it's integral. Mm. But you see that stages thing all the time. That green thinks that it's integral because it, it will accept people from whatever background, from whatever gender, sexuality, da da da, it, as all equal. And that's a valuable perspective. But they mistake that for being integral because ultimately it, there's actually a hidden tribalism there because they're othering and rejecting anyone that doesn't agree with them about their particular perspective. They don't actually understand. And the paradox is a lot of the people um, that they are uh, being inclusive towards probably don't share their views, almost certainly don't share their views. If you're going to be like very inclusive towards um, immigrants from everywhere around the world, you're going to be being inclusive towards a lot of people with very traditional values. And that's a hugely, that's a, that's a very weird position to find yourself in, which is why you end up in a position in the UK election where all the people that supposedly you are supporting, like you're saying, oh, we're, we're for the many, we're supporting all of the working class, we're supporting all of the downtrodden. It's like, well, they've told you to fuck off. Mm. They've pretty much universally turned around and said, we don't want your faux compassion. We don't want your condescension. We don't want your student politics masquerading as virtue. We don't want your virtue signaling. We want, uh, we want people who understand our values, who value what we value, which... And David Goodhart uh, said this really well when he talked about somewheres and anywheres, like a really good definition. It's like the anywheres are you identify with um, your achievements, so your degree, your profession that you can take anywhere around the world. You, you're sort of you're you're liberated from space and place. And then the somewheres are much more rooted in a place, an identity that's tied to being like a Cornish fisherman or um, a Welsh miner, or and you and you're much more you're somewhere, not in anywhere. And that division has become huge, especially with Brexit and especially in the UK. And that's the one that's been sort of underneath a lot of the, what we're seeing with being rejected by um, the UK electorate, or with Labour being rejected by the UK electorate. And I think another a good point in that is that the anywheres tend to live in the big cities, in London, New York, Paris, wherever, and somewheres tend to live in the countryside. So we, we see in America, in the UK, this huge divide between the kind of metropolitan cities and the values at play and, and the countryside, which is, again, why it's a big shocker for um, people in a particular kind of London filter bubble, where London, for example, votes mainly Labour, to see the rest of the country really thinks differently. There's just one point around, uh, one idea from integral studies I think is also quite useful to bring in to this conversation, which is a pre-trans fallacy. So to take your point before about something like immigration, right? So uh, from a, a level of development which cares about me, my family, my tribe, say like red in that model, the, the natural response might be close the borders, it's just us, we're, we're going to isolate, and then green might have the perspective of no, let's let everyone in, what is a nation anyway, let's play with this, let's kind of deconstruct that, which is also a natural stage. And then the next level up is the more nuanced level where it goes, hang on, maybe we should have some restrictions and maybe in this situation it's like this and in other situations it's like that. The pre-trans fallacy is really useful because it points out that the, the tends to go, uh, for example, should there be, in that example, should there be limits to immigration? It goes, yes, from that red tribalist. Yes, there should be because I want to protect me and my family. Then the green goes, no. And then, again, the more nuanced perspective might say kind of yes, but also no. So people confuse the two. So as soon as you, for example, mention, well, actually, I think sometimes immigration is like, oh, but you're one of them. You know, so that pre-trans fallacy is a really core concept. I encourage, you know, it's a kind of a big concept to research, but I find it particularly useful for something like this because it can kind of uh, clarify a lot of where a lot of reactivity comes from, where it doesn't necessarily need to be. And I want to put in a little clip from Diane Michaud Hamilton as well, the Zen priest, mediator, and also expert on integral theory. And she, she uses the integral map because the integral map basically from the sort of red to, to green to integral is about how many perspectives are you including? Are you able to, are you, you start from an egocentric to a family to a world centric perspective. And it's, it's really a developmental journey of how many, how many perspectives can you incorporate into your uh, view? How do you also hold multiple perspectives? 
Now right here it gets a little bit dicey because some of these communication skills correlate to what we, we talk about when we talk about human development. It is not a given that everyone in the room can hold two perspectives in their body mind at the same time without an overabundance of chaos and tension and will naturally collapse into one. So one of the ways that I became engaged with Ken Wilber and Integral Institute is in my work as a mediator, particularly around difficult conversations like race and gender and social justice and those kinds of things, is I started to observe real differences in people's capacities. Some people couldn't take their own perspective. They'd either been abused or marginalized. Some people could take one perspective, their own, but not the other. Some people could take their own and even start to be able to hear the perspective of others, but couldn't take a perspective of a court or a judge. And that was literally that observation I started to use a stage model in my own work. And so related to what um, Diane was saying as well is this concept that we've talked a lot about on the channel, which is the shadow. So the shadow in Jungian psychology is all those aspects of ourselves that we reject and push away and say, that's not me. But in the process, we project out onto the other. And it comes out as a kind of disgust. And we see it in politics all the time. The whole process of othering people is very much a shadow process of they have, there's some aspect of myself that I hate. and that person's got it, but I don't have it because I'm, I'm a good guy. And Jung famously said that none of us are as good a person as we think we are. You know, so a big part of development is to, to look at those aspects of ourselves. And I think uh, no one explains it uh, better than uh, Doshin Roshi. Of course people don't want to do it. The, the addiction in post-modernity seems to be wanting to feel good. You know, you can't do the deeper work if you're limited to feeling good. There, there was a Buddhist can we, teacher... Can we blame the baby boomers for that? No, we can't blame anybody. We have to take responsibility. Blaming won't help. Fair enough. It's part of the problem. We must take responsibility. The rescuer, the victim, and the perpetrator. This is an endless cycle. In post-modernity, they are identified with the rescuer, which is really, deep down, it's the savior, the archetype of the savior. Now, how deep are those roots in Christian soil? The victim is the sacrificial lamb who must be sacrificed and stay sacrificed no redemption and the perpetrator becomes the scapegoat that in the Talmud the Old Testament was loaded up with the sins of the people and chased into the desert to die the scapegoat the one that carried the burdens which meant we had to we had to account for our sins on the day of atonement Yom Kippur my favorite holiday. <laughs> so we must add something to this tr trilogy to make it whole and complete. And what we add in Integral Zen is the witness who sees everything, the whole dynamics. The rescuer keeps the victim stuck in perpetual victimhood, unable to take responsibility, and projects their own responsibility, blames the scapegoat. So there's also something Jonathan Haidt talks about, which is how polarization and division has grown. And he looks at sort of political mapping and how there used to be an overlap. We might be show this picture. There used to be a bit of an overlap between the two sides, and now they're getting more and more apart. And But the key part of that is is not so much that they have different views, it's what they think of the other side. And how in the last 20 years, and especially it seems like over the last few years since the beginning of social media, like now it's not just this side is, is wrong and I disagree, it's this side is evil. There's something definitively wrong with, with these people. Who are they? We don't even understand, they're not even human. That kind of sense, and that's the real danger is where do you go when that starts becoming your kind of the way you think about the other side then where do you end up you end up in some pretty nasty places pretty quickly mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people feeling that things are getting far more concerning if we can't find our common humanity and at least start having conversations where we start understanding and seeing each other as human rather than different 
I mean, there's something quite there's something quite interesting in that for me that just comes up, which is the the slippery slope, the kind of the, the movement from ah, this is a kind of a fringe. It's not really you know. There's a few really extreme thinking people, but I think what's very important for everyone, all of us, to be aware of is that if we're not really aware of our language, our rhetoric, how we other people, then we're all susceptible to a slippery slope in that way. Now, I've been seeing people, hearing people at parties or wherever, um, talking about people on the other side, talking about Tories, for example, as scum, like scum, dirt. They're not worth like they're like they're not human. And it's like it astonishes me. Because, because the, the, the performative contradiction of saying you're the good guys and we're the inclusive people and we care about the other people and, and we're the nice ones and everyone else is so mean and, blah, blah, blah. and then in the same breath dehumanizing anyone who disagrees with you, it boggles my mind. And frankly, you're not progressive. You're not progressive like that. You, like, and it is essential. This is why the shadow is such an important concept. It is essential that we all understand that we are all capable of being the oppressor, you know, like it's just, and have that within us. Mm. It's, and the hubris, narcissism and arrogance of thinking anything else is astonishing and ends in tears. I've seen a lot of that after this election, kind of people ranting on social media. It's not just the Tories or uh, the opposition. It's also now blaming the people, like blaming the British people for rejecting uh, Labour. Like, oh, the people are stupid. The people, it's like, this is, this is in, incredible, like the arrogance of that is incredible. And also it ties into virtue signaling as well. And in the piece that we're about to release with Daniel Schmachtenberg of the War on Sense Making 2, he makes a really interesting little digression about virtue signaling, like what virtue signaling is compared to what it, um, like what genuine virtue is that I'd like to play. One way that I think of the distinction between real virtue and virtue signaling is virtue signaling is when it's clear that an, enough people hold a particular trait as a virtue that if I seem to have that virtue, it would be good for me, right? The people would like me, accept me, agree with me, buy my stuff, like my ideas, whatever it is. So if I signal, if I communicate in some way that I have that virtue, it's beneficial for me in straight self-serving ways, right? So I have a reason to signal the virtue beyond my authentic living of it. A real virtue is something that is that I care about, that I value. Actually, hopefully, something that is sacred to me. That I am willing to experience personal sacrifice for. Not that my signaling of it creates personal gain, but I am willing to lose personal gain in service of this because it's more important than personal gain to me. So yeah, hopefully for me at least this can be a kind of blank slate. Like I've seen so much enthusiasm and passion from a lot of my friends kind of energized by uh, either Jeremy Corbyn or by kind of the Labour Party and progressive politics, which I think is fantastic. For me, they've been taken advantage of, frankly. Like these are Corbyn and McDonnell and Milne and Andrew Murray, those kind of people, like the old guard of the sort of 1970s leftists, have basically been the recipients of some really well-meaning and energy that could go towards a good cause. And I think they've kind of taken advantage of it. So I, I'm hoping that this kind of will be able to all of that energy and all of that potential for change can now be put into something more valuable. Yeah, and for me it's very much, I like the idea of a blank slate because I think like rebel wisdom is in many ways a process of inquiry. And so it's like, I don't know where to go next. I don't know where, what all the different, I don't know what direction we need to go, but I think we've had a lot of people on the channel talking about pieces of that puzzle. You know, and so there's a lot of, and that inquiry is ongoing. So my hope is that and it kind of begins with a, a sense of humility that we all have to just say, okay, we're, we're not quite sure. The world is very different now. There's many different routes we could go in. Certainly, my hope is that it moves towards somewhere more uh, empathetic where we, we don't all have to agree, but at least we can kind of create something through our disagreement instead of it just kind of polarizing us in, in little bubbles. So my hope is that kind of some kind of like opening up and less rigidity and uh, an openness to different perspectives is at least part of you know, what might drive us forward somewhere decent. And if you've made it this far, congratulations. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments and see you soon.
Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.